to the class we're doing today. I think that the label of our, our class is Offer Negotiation and Presentation. Um, like the, all of the classes, if, and just for disclosure for everyone who's in the room, um, if this one's going to run about two hours, and, um, and we will, should be out of here right around five, give or take. If you don't have two hours, that's fine, okay? Just exit out the back door and, you know, come and go as you please, but we're videoing it, so just, you know, and by the way, ask questions. Just because we're on camera doesn't mean no one asks questions, so if you've got something that sounds funny, don't hesitate to ask a question. Um, having said that, if you're watching this on the video, and for those of you that weren't in the room yesterday, um, you're probably better off watching the video on, um, whatever was the name of the class we did yesterday, contract, um, what are we purchase called? Agreement. Purchase, purchase agreement. Purchase agreement. Purchase agreement, purchase contract. We have a four hour video on the purchase agreement. Um, and a lot of the stuff we're going to cover, I'm not going to get into as much detail on the specific line items because we spent four hours yesterday going through all of those. So if you haven't participated or seen the contract purchase agreement class, you probably want to take four hours, watch that video first, and then come back and do this. Or if you're just an expert at the purchase contract, then a lot of this will make a lot more sense. Okay, the gist of what we're going to discuss today is preparing an offer for your buyer, that negotiation process, and the presentation process of that offer to the listing agent, or believe it or not, we used to actually present offers directly to the sellers. That's fairly rare in this market, but maybe one day that will come back. So we're going to discuss writing an offer with our buyer, negotiating that offer not only with the buyer, but basically with the listing agent, and then ultimately with the seller, assuming we have any contact. So how we're going to start, we're going to take a little different approach. We're actually going to show you a couple of offers that have been written on. These are real offers. As a matter of fact, we probably, since we're videoing this, we probably should start blocking out names and addresses. I guess we'll have to deal with that later. Um, but at any rate, these are real offers. And the first offer I'm going to show you is a bad example of how not to write an offer. As a matter of fact, you probably can't see it on the video, but for those of you in the room, the name of this PDF file is bad offer number one. Okay. So bottom line is we have a couple of things. And here we have an agent. Um, this is her fax cover letter. Um, there's nothing wrong with handwriting fax cover letters. I will tell you, however, the entire purpose of our two hours is for us to project the most professional offer we possibly can. And some of the things I'm going to talk about are real minor. They may sound real nitpicky. Um, but I've got to tell you, a pet peeve of mine is getting fax cover letters that are handwritten, that I can't read. If you have great penmanship, that's fine. But if you don't have the most fantastic penmanship in the world, I would suggest <clears throat> that you don't handwrite not only your cover letters, I would certainly suggest you don't handwrite your offers. Okay? Make them look as clean and professional as you possibly can. Also, this fax cover letter has probably been copied about a thousand times, and I won't scroll back up to reveal the logo and the name of the agent, and they may still be in business, I don't know. But at any rate, it just, when I get this, it does not project professionalism to me, okay? And that's really what this is all about. We want to project professionalism, okay? And I mean literally from the very beginning. So if, and first of all, if we're still faxing offers to clients, when I say clients, I mean um, our buyers, or if we're faxing client offers to our colleagues, meaning the listing agent, um, I would suggest you stop doing that. Faxing is old school technology. Do not fax anymore. Let's get rid of the fax. Let's do, frankly, the, probably the best single thing to do is deliver these offers personally, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But get the offers scanned in a nice, clean PDF file, and get these emailed, okay? Um, faxing is old school technology. We don't want to be messing around with old school technology anymore. So at any rate, going through this offer, um, again, here's your cover letter. We've got a um, another letter that's been provided, 
okay, which on the surface, and this was emailed over, excuse me, or faxed over as part of the offer, and basically what the buyer's agent is doing is telling me that their buyer um, apparently has money in an exchange, um, the exchange funds are in the amount, they have $70,000, $69,836 from the sale of their property on a property in Rialto, and in effect, this is kind of a proof of funds letter from them. So on balance, this is a good thing. Okay, so guess what? So we've got some proof of funds. Um, it looks like maybe this was part of a 1031 exchange. So I get to page two of the of the documents that are sent to me. And I'm like, okay, well maybe we're maybe we're looking okay here. Okay. Um, then I get to page three of the facts, and I have a copy of the earnest money deposit check. Okay, which is normal. Okay. In most cases, you're going to want to send a copy of the earnest money deposit check, or at least have a copy of the earnest money deposit check available to present to the listing agent and then ultimately to the seller. Now, really quickly, is there anything on this check that catches your eye that's possibly a negative? Again, if you're on the video, maybe you can catch it for yourself, and I don't know how well this is going to come out. Um, on the video, but keep in mind, even if you're watching this on video, all of these documents that we have on the screen are available for you to download and, and have in your hand while you're watching the video. So this would be page, I think, three of our scans. Anybody see anything that's in the room, a problem with this? Should the names and uh, the, um, on the bottom where all the numbers are? Yep. That should be blocked out? Yeah, maybe. That's not what I was looking for. Okay. So the question, if you couldn't hear it on the camera, is there's personal information on here, account numbers, should we disclose that to the public and the world? The short answer is we probably shouldn't be, but that's not what I'm concerned about. This is what jumps out at me. When you open up a brand new checking account, what do they normally give you with your brand new checking account? Starter checks. Starter checks. And normally they start out at check number what? 100, 101. Okay? So, now, on its surface, is that a problem? Probably not, but as someone who's done this for a long time, I tend to kind of put on my, on my analytical um, thinking hat when I'm looking at these, and when I see a check from a, a consumer buyer, basically, and it appears to me to be on a brand new checking account, it makes me think a little bit, okay? Now, that may be unfair, but bottom line is it makes oops. Bottom line is that makes me think a little bit. So that in itself is not a problem, but it is something I've got in the back of my mind. So I now potentially have a buyer. There's a brand new checking account. They have, by the way, made the checkout to Remax 2000 Realty. That's fine. Made it out to the brokerage. That's written the offer. No big deal. Okay. So. Moving right along, they've given me a copy of the multiple listing printout, um, which is fine. It's not a bad idea, not a bad idea to get in the habit of printing out a copy of the MLS printout, attaching it to the offer. If for no other reason, at least we know we're talking about the same property on occasion, maybe things get mixed up. So now the listing agent is looking at at this and saying, okay, yep, there's my price and there's my address and these are the comments that I put in the MLS and you know maybe maybe the buyer thinks there's a pool and now all of a sudden we realize, oops, we put the pool box and there's not a pool or there's a spa and there's not a spa or maybe we said it was it, it wasn't an HOA and we realize it isn't an HOA. So I kind of like this because when I'm looking at offers on my inventory and the listing or the buyer's agent sends me over a copy of my MLS. To be honest with you, I stop for just a second and I take a look at it and I make sure, okay, did the MLS reflect what it should have? So I like this. So this is, this is a good thing. I kind of like that. They've given us a copy of the agency disclosure form um, signed by the buyer, I'm assuming. Yep, signed by the buyer. So we've got a copy of agency, which by the way, we, again, we've talked about this in the contract class. If your buyer has not signed an agency relationship form, Oops, called the Disclosure Regarding Real Estate Agency Relationships. If they have not signed this and you've already written an offer for them, that's no good. The absolute latest the buyer should be signing the agency relationship form 
is when, prior to writing an offer for them. And ideally, they need to be signing this form when you're actively engaged in showing them property. You've shown them a property, you should get this signed. As soon as you establish an agency relationship with your buyer, this needs to be presented to them, this disclosure needs to be presented to them, and they need to execute it. Not three weeks after the offer's been written, and you're, or after close of escrow. That's a big no-no. These needs to be done immediately. So anyway, this buyer's agent has signed this. They've sent it over, so that's great. So again, we've got some positives. This is page two of the agency relationship form. Um, they've sent over a copy of a um, um, credit report. And look at this. I got great FICO scores, 803, 788, 791, totally appropriate to black things out, go ahead and redact some account numbers, that's perfectly fine. So this is not a bad thing. They have sent us over a copy of a credit report and, and indicating that credit is, is pretty good, right? Let's take a quick second look at that. All the FICOs, you know, the three, the three scoring agencies, 788 is the lowest, 803 is the highest, not shabby. Okay, pretty good. Okay, now we actually get to the offer. Okay, now a couple things here. When you're writing an offer, I think your goal should be you want to write the offer and you want to present the offer in such a fashion that the seller should be able to accept the offer as written. Okay? The goal should be, you want to write, for lack of a better description, a perfect offer. Now, now I understand, wait a minute Lance, they're, off, they're asking $300,000 and we're writing an offer for two fifty. dollars The expectation is, is they're probably not going to accept our two fifty dollars because maybe it's worth $300,000. Okay? I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is everything within the index, hopefully the price as well, but everything in the offer itself should basically be acceptable to the seller. And if it's not acceptable, hopefully the only things that you're going to get a counteroffer back on are going to be the big items, the price, okay? Maybe the closing cost, maybe the closing date, okay? But if you're getting a counteroffer back that has a whole bunch of other things in it, it's probably because you're not writing the offer properly, okay? And that's kind of what we're going to sh demonstrate on this offer very, very quickly, okay? Now, we have a four, about four people here in the class. Um, I'm going to kind of ask for some participation, but keep in mind we're, we're videoing this, so that makes it a little tough for the people who are going to watch us on video. But let's, oh, by the way, this is an older offer, okay? This offer was written in 2005. And the revision date on this offer is December, excuse me, of October of 2002. So if this offer looks a little different than the most current offer that we're using today, because this offer is six years old, um, that's okay. Don't worry about it. The terms and the conditions and the language are more or less materially, materially the same. And the mistakes basically are going to be materially the same. So let's go through this. Um, the new offer, the date's actually on the other side, so on and so forth. But anyway, we've got the date the offer's written, we've got it was written in a city, there's the buyer, this is the property address, we've got an accessor parcel number, um, the property situated in Riverside County. For some reason, the buyer's agent needed to write in the word Riverside. They probably made a mistake, okay, when the offer was originally printed. It must have said maybe Los Angeles County. Buyer's agent got it probably executed, and then went back and it looks like they whited something out over here and then wrote in Riverside. Is that a deal killer? No. Do I like it? No. Okay. What I would much rather prefer is reprint the offer or at least reprint page one, have Riverside County typed in properly, and then if your buyer already initialed it, then get them to reinitial. Okay. But again, not necessarily something that would have to generate a counteroffer, but not necessarily what I want to do. Okay? We've got a purchase price of $260,000. Now, if you go back to the MLS, let's, let's talk some real stuff here. If you go back to the MLS, this property was listed for $293,999. So basically, let's just say, say $295,000. Okay? 
and they've written the offer for 260. So, you know, we're about 35,000, 34,000 dollars apart. Now that in itself could be cause for a counteroffer or negotiating price. Okay, let's put that aside for a minute. Okay, so when we're sitting back and we're going to talk to our seller, one of the things that we're going to talk to with our seller is, okay, let's identify the big challenges, price and terms, closing dates, those sort of things. But let's also identify other areas in the offer that need some attention. So the very first item, which may be a big one, we're $35,000, $34,000 off on price. So we're going to make a note of that. Close of escrow shall occur on, when is this escrow scheduled to close? Never. Okay? Okay. So an agent has taken the time. Who knows how long they've been working with this buyer, but for enough to actually get them in their vehicle, show them a piece of property, get them back into the office, write an offer, take the time to package the offer, send it over to the listed agent's office for presentation, and they fail at some point in time to either ask the buyer, when do you want to close escrow? and or if they did ask the buyer they didn't put it on the contract so getting back to my original premise we want to be able to write offers that can be accepted by the seller with no changes okay so let's assume for a moment that my seller is willing to accept a two hundred and sixty thousand dollar purchase price coming down can my seller, going no further on the rest of the eight pages of the contract, can my seller accept this contract as is? No. We have to generate a counter if for no other reason we have to establish a closing date. So we haven't even gotten past item number one and I already have a counter offer that I have to generate. If my seller thinks this is a great offer and I think it's a great offer, I cannot just sign it and open escrow tomorrow. I have to generate a counteroffer. Is this kind of a big deal? Yeah, it's a big deal. You know? <clears throat> now, quite honestly, we may talk about some other things that are maybe seem a little ticky tacky, but what is this? If you watched our, our purchase contract agreement um, video yesterday that we did yesterday, this is a contract. We don't use the word contract on our forms because we like to water it down and we say this is a purchase agreement because agreements are are softer and easier to the public this is a contract what happens if you make a, a mistake on your contract you get sued you get a problem you get sued yeah. if you omit something or incorrectly put something in you're opening yourself up to liability what are the buyers and sellers in the transactions looking for us to do for them Keep them out of trouble. Keep them out of trouble. Represent them. We, we know this stuff inside and out. We are the professionals. We get paid a lot of money to do this sort of stuff. They are expecting us to represent them properly. And this is, this is a rookie mistake at best. If they had just sat down and read the offer and proofread the offer before it was submitted, Anybody should have caught that. Oops, I forgot to put in the closing date. So anyway, we have a we have to generate a counteroffer no matter what. Have to on this particular property. Okay, moving right along. And again, I'm gonna move a little faster here because we're we're I don't want to get too hung up on this. How much is our deposit? Earnest money deposit. Two thousand. Two thousand bucks. Let's go back up here. We have a check for two thousand bucks. Right? Okay. Good. Things match up. I like that. Let's go back to page one of our offer. Now again, this is a little bit of an older offer, but it's the same language that's on the most current offer. Increased deposit, buyer shall increase deposit, 50,000 bucks. Do you believe, let me bring this up on the screen a little bit. Do you believe that that's what the buyer intended to do? We talked about this in yesterday's class, okay? I don't believe that's what the buyer intended to do. I believe that this $50,000 is supposed to be down under balance of purchase price, okay, 
but instead the agent has put it up as an increased deposit. What that tells me at a minimum, if you put $50,000 in the increased deposit, you then have to put something in these blanks. Well, when are you going to increase the deposit? Well, I have to do it within so many days. That's blank. Or I have to do it within a date. Well, that's blank. Do I have to generate a counteroffer for this? At least item number two. So I now have at least two items in my counteroffer. One, when is the escrow going to close? What's the date? Oh, and by the way, the $50,000 increased deposit, when are you going to put that into our escrow? So I have to issue item two on the counteroffer. Buyer agrees to increase their deposit to the tune of an additional $50,000 within five days of acceptance. Now, that begs the question, which I know the answer to, did they really want to increase their deposit or was that supposed to be the balance of their purchase price and down payment? There's a difference between earnest money deposit and balance of down payment. They are not the same thing and contractually they have completely different meanings. Okay? So I called this agent up. Obviously we had a conversation about a whole bunch of things. And I indicated to the agent, hey, actually I wasn't playing cute with them. I just flat out said, I don't believe you meant to have a $52,000 earnest deposit. I believe you meant to have a $2,000 earnest deposit. Um, you wrote your offer incorrectly. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to counter that out. Unless you're going to confirm with me that you did mean to have a $52,000 earnest money deposit. And if that is the case, how much time does the buyer need to put in the additional $50,000? Because I have to generate a counteroffer now. Oh, and by the way, would you mind telling me what the, what, when you wanted to close? So again, even if I wanted to accept this offer, I can't. I have at least two items that have to be cleaned up here. Amount of the first loan is blank. Okay? Blank, blank, blank. I got a line drawn through here, and then I come down here. Balance of purchase price included $208,000. Total purchase price of $260,000. The way this offer is written, how much is the loan? The loan is zero. This is written as cash. Okay? So if, I, if I'm solely interpreting the contract, $2,000 initial deposit, $50,000 additional, excuse me, $2,000 initial deposit, $50,000 increased deposit, total deposit $52,000, the buyer is going to bring an additional $208,000 in cash for a total purchase price of $260,000. This buyer needs how much cash to close? About 260,000 bucks, right? Plus closing costs. Let's go back up. Remember this letter? How much money does the buyer have? According to this, they got about 70,000 bucks. I don't have proof of funds that say the buyer has $260,000. So when I go back down to this page, is it safe to assume that the agent has now made at least their third mistake? Okay? I think what the agent wanted to do is the loan that they're going to get is going to be $208,000, right? The $50,000 that's up here needs to come down here, and then we're kind of in balance. The agent has written a cash offer. Now, let's assume I'm not a nice guy, okay? And let's assume, let's just stop right here on, before we even get to the bottom of page one. Let's assume that the seller says, actually 260 is all I wanted, and I have a $260,000 cash offer with a $52,000 deposit. Let's sign this sucker, right? And I'm not a very savvy listing agent, and I say, yeah, and we sign it. We now have a contract between a buyer and a seller under terms and conditions that the buyer has absolutely no ability to meet. Who would be in breach of contract in the event the buyer and seller accepted this as written? Again, we're not going any farther. Who's in breach of contract? 
the, well, the buyer, yeah. and who has a terrible agent? So, well, they both have terrible agents, but the buyer's agent is probably a little bit more terrible than the listing agent, because the buyer's agent has now contractually obligated this buyer to a cash deal that they cannot possibly close, and have put at least two thousand dollars of their money in jeopardy, but potentially have opened them themselves up to larger jeopardy in the event at some point the buyer did put in this additional $50,000. This is bad business. This is done all the time. This is the norm. I hate to say it. I see more offers like this than I do clean offers. Okay? So again, we have a challenge here. We haven't even got to the bottom of page one yet. So we have another counter offer, and again, while I'm having that third phone call now back to the buyer's agent, oh, I know I called you a minute ago about the closing date. Uh, oh, but I know I just called you another minute ago about the deposit, the fifty thousand um, oh, dollars. Oh, I know I'm calling you for the third time. Did you really mean to do cash? Oh no. And then I'll probably say, okay, you know what? I tell you what. Why don't you hold on the line here for a few more minutes? Let me go through the other seven pages of this offer and let's see how many more issues and mistakes that we have. Okay? So at any rate, we've identified a few. Um, let's see what else we've got. And again, this is an older offer. It's formatted a little bit differently. Um, but and then we've got our contingencies and our stuff in here. Um, let's go to page um, let's go to page two. This is in a little different spot. The new contract doesn't reflect it this way, but the buyer has asked for the seller to pay for a termite inspection. They haven't requested the company. That in itself isn't a huge problem, but if you have a blank on a contract that doesn't give you an option to check a box or something, you need to fill out the blank. Put something needs to go in here. Who's the termite company? Seller's choice, any reliable, ABC termite, whatever it happens to be. But anyway, we're gonna leave that alone for a moment. Having said that, the buyer on this particular deal and the formatting of this is a little different in the old contract as opposed to the new contract, but it's basically the same. The sellers are have a, the buyer is asking the seller to pay for a termite inspection, okay? But they have not checked the WPA form, which is also needs to be mandated and needs to be checked. It's in a different spot on the new contract, but it also needs to be checked on the new contract. But they didn't check the WPA form. So now I guess the fourth phone call back to the buyer's agent says. You've asked for a termite inspection, however, let me be clear, you have not asked for, if there is correction work required, you have not asked for it to be done. Correct? Correct. Okay. Um, now, I could play coy and I could say, oh, forget that's their fault. I'm just not going to acknowledge it. We're just going to blow right by that and then I'll wink, wink, nod, nod to my seller and say, hey, guess what? They asked for termite report but they didn't say they wanted you to pay for it, so let's consider that a win and let's just move on. Okay? I would suggest that's not the best approach. Because especially, are, are most buyers, if they're asking for a termite report, are they expecting it to be clear? They are. And let's suppose there's $1,000 worth of work here. The buyer's expectation is probably that somebody other than them is going to pay for it. I would rather deal with that today than opposed to playing gotcha 30 days from now. And the gotcha would be 30 days from now the report comes back, we send it to the buyer's agent, it has $1,000 worth of work, the buyer's agent says, oh great, well when are you gonna complete the work and give us a clearance? And we say, gotcha, we're not. Well what do you mean you're not? Well we, we saw it in the beginning, you didn't check the box. <laughs> great. And then what happens? The deal falls apart. And the deal falls apart. <laughs> They don't have the money, the seller doesn't want to pay because you told them they wouldn't have to, the buyer was expecting, and the deal falls apart. Or guess what? The buyer's agent calls you back and says, well, I've got you back. The buyer ain't going to pay for it. I guess your seller ain't going to pay for it, and I don't have any money to pay for it, so you want to close the deal or not? Maybe you can pay for it, listing agent, or maybe we'll split it. Don't play gotcha when you're negotiating these offers. If you identify a problem in advance, deal with it in advance fix it now, even if it means, hey, you forgot to ask the seller to pay for the termite repairs. Is that what you intended? Oh, yes, it is. Then let's deal with it today, okay? And believe me, you're doing your seller a service by dealing with it up front. Some of you may go, oh, wait a minute, now the you just committed the seller to pay 
I didn't really commit the seller to pay anything. We're still negotiating at this point. Okay? Now we can discuss whether or not it's a good practice as a listing agent, which it is a good practice, by the way. If I'm the listing agent on this property, which I was, when I get that property listed, what's one of the very first things I'm going to do? Specifically talking about termite reports. I'm going to order a termite report. And it's going to come back clear, or it's going to come back with some repairs. I already know if this is an issue. I already know if, hey, there's $1,000 worth of repairs to be done. I know exactly what I'm dealing with at the time this offer. It's not a guess. So when I sit down as the listing agent and I'm presenting this offer to my seller, I immediately sit back and say, okay, you remember when we took the listing, we ordered the termite, here's the termite, we discussed it three weeks ago, it's $1,000, guess what? These people are, no, they haven't, but these people are going to ask for you to do that. Are you prepared to pay $1,000? No, I'm not. Okay, great, then we'll deal with it. Yes, I am. I was expecting to pay for it anyway. Then great, we'll deal with it. But at any rate, do we have to deal with some sort of counter potentially on this item? Yes. We have another issue that has to be dealt with. Um, again, this looks a little bit different on the, newer, on the newer contract, but the questions basically are the same. Sellers to pay for a septic and private um, sewage disposal system. Seller to pay for that ins inspection. This property is not on a septic. Okay? If you're the listing agent, you need to know are your properties on septic. If you are representing a buyer, prior to writing an offer, you need to know the answer to that question. We do not, do not go through and just start checking boxes saying, well, we don't know. If it's on a septic, we'll ask for them to have it inspected. That's not how we do business. If you are writing an offer and you are uncertain if the property is on septic, you inquire and you find out before you write the offer. This property is in downtown Riverside. It's been on a sewer for 100 years, or at least 50 years. Um, this box should not be checked. Is it a big deal that they've checked it? Is it a big deal? No. Okay? But to me, it tells me I have a lazy buyer's agent. I have a lazy buyer's agent that's just checking boxes willy-nilly. Okay? Same thing with seller to pay to have domestic well tested. This property is in downtown Riverside. There is no well on this property. This box should not be checked. Again, I have a lazy agent. Now, if I want to be hardcore on my counteroffer, I could probably just ignore those items and just, you know, no big deal. It doesn't apply kind of a thing. But, I don't, I, I, let me rephrase that as far as being hardcore. If I want to be accurate and concise and complete in addressing all the terms and conditions of this contract, should I counter these two items out? Mm -hmm. Yes, I should. So I have at least two more items that need to be addressed. You know, item number such and such B1 does not apply and B2 does not apply. Two more items to attach, okay? And by the way, if the buyer's agent had done nothing other than refer back to the multiple listing printout sheet to look, is the property on a well, is the property on a septic? If she, which, by the way, do we want to trust those all the time? No. But assuming she had done some research, she would have realized that these, that these property doesn't have those items. Natural hazard disclosure, that's fine. Blank, blank, that's fine. Seller to pay for smoke protector, that's fine. Seller to pay for the cost of mandatory minatory, that's fine. And again, it looks a little different, but neither here nor there. Buyer and seller to pay their 50-50 in escrow fees, that's fine. They've done the seller's choice or roll in escrow. I'm okay with that. Don't, don't necessarily have a problem with that. Um, they're in effect saying, hey, we'd like to use our escrow, but if the seller wants to use First American or whatever it happens to be, that's fine. So that's great. Seller's going to pay for title insurance, that's fine. Should we have something issued here? Yeah, it should say who's it going to be. Okay, seller's choice, first American title, whatever it happens to be, it's blank. Okay, seller to pay county transfer tax, that's fine. If there is a county transfer tax, that's fine. Seller to pay city transfer tax, again, that's fine. City Riverside transfer tax. There was no HOA on this one. Um, who's paying for the home warranty on this contract? If you're watching on the video, you have to look at the contract that you've had in front of you. The boxes aren't checked. Okay, so. It's obvious that the, the buyer's agent and the buyer discussed 
a home protection plan, which by the way, I don't like the term home warranty. I would suggest you not use home warranty, okay? Use home protection plan. Home warranty implies exactly what the word said, warranty. And warranty also kind of implies that things are maybe warranty that maybe aren't. Home protection plan is a little bit looser than that, and I think it's a more accurate definition. But at any rate, the buyer's agent has asked for $500 to be spent on this um, home protection plan. AC, water heater, electric, plumbing, and blah, 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 blah. Roof and septic. Going to buy septic coverage on a property with no septic. But who's going to pay for it? I think this is now my fifth phone call back to the buyer's agent saying, you have asked for something and you have left it blank. Do I have to counter this point? Again, remember, my seller wanted to accept 260, right? I have at least, I think, seven items now that I have to generate on the form of a counter if for no other reason the buyer's agent was lazy or worse, okay? So again, who's going to pay for it, okay? Additional inspections blank. Okay, we've got our statutory disclosures. Now the buyer's agent from this point forward starts to do a little bit better. And the only reason they start to do a little bit better is because for the most part, the only places you write a whole bunch of information on the contract is on page one and page two, okay? Page three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, there's not a whole lot to write, okay? That's by design, by the way, and we discussed that in our, in our purchase contract class. Um, and CAR has intentionally made these contracts as idiot-proof as they possibly could. Fill out as little as you possibly can because if you give the realtors the opportunity to fill out information, they make a lot of mistakes. And frankly, even if they omit things, what happens when you omit something from a contract? Which, by the way, who ends up paying for a lot of these mistakes? Well, it's either going to be the principals, the buyer or the seller. And if it's not the buyer or the seller, who ends up paying for these? Who ends up paying for the home warranty? Agent or the broker. The agent or the broker. Agent is the broker. If I'm representing the buyer, and this, let's just suppose this is the only mistake I've made, and it slipped past everybody, okay? Now all of a sudden we get ready to close escrow, and the buyer's expecting a home warranty, and now all of a sudden escrow catches the fact that, oh geez, it looks like somebody wanted this, but no, who's paying for it? And then, you know, a phone call or an email goes out, and escrow says, hey, who's paying for this? And the buyer looks at their agent and says, well, Pretty sure we talked about it, and pretty sure you said let's as a seller to pay for it. And I don't want to pay for it, but I need it, right? Who ends up paying for it? Normally, the in this particular case, probably the buyer's agent. Okay, or guess what? Agents tend to dig in there. Oh, well, geez, I don't. I can't do it. I'm not making any money on the deal anyway. I promised him I was going to buy him a new stove and a roof and da 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 da. Would you mind splitting it with me? Good old buddy listing agent. Okay? Come on! So, at any rate, we want to clean that up. Okay, now we're on page three. Pretty deep, again, old contract, I get it, but guess what? Page three is perfect. Only, the only thing they had to do on page three was put an initial on the bottom. Page four, doesn't look too bad. Um, but, I look at this, and then I get Concern. Why is this underlined? You have a question? Should we discuss at this time title investing? Sure. Did we go past title investing? It's just there. Okay. It's there. We can discuss it. Um, there's nothing contractually under the title investing part that I would necessarily be a red flag to my, my buyer necessarily. Well, how to take title? Um, well, again, yeah, but again, go back to maybe, actually we didn't really discuss that a whole lot in the contracts class. If you're going to have a discussion with your buyer specifically on how to take title, that's a tough, that's a tough conversation to have. There's a lot of legal implications on that, tax implications on that. The vast majority of husbands and wife, for example, take you know, husband and wife as joint tenants. That is not the type of recommendation that you can make to your buyer, though. Okay? From our perspective on presenting this, although it's a discussion that needs to be had, and it's one of those discussions if you're writing the offer, and your buyers are in front of you and you address, hey, I think this was just a single lady, which by the way, is there a difference 
Let's go back. Well, her name's irrelevant. Um, Sally Smith. There's one person who was buying this property. Is If Sally Smith has been married before, how is Sally Smith and is married today? And she's the only one buying the property. John Smith is not buying this property. How does Sally Smith hold title? Married woman. Sally Smith, a married woman, sold on separate property, more than likely. Okay? Let's suppose Sally Smith has never been married. How does Sally Smith hold title? Every single woman. Sally Smith, a single woman. Sally Smith has now been divorced. Now does how, how does Sally Smith hold title? Divorced. She's divorced. Okay. Sally Smith, an unmarried woman. She's no longer single. You can only be single once. Once you get married and divorced, you are not single anymore. Okay? <laughs> now, that you might be single for other purposes, but legally, you are no longer single. You are unmarried. So, these are the type of things that you have to have. And by the way, is that an important conversation? It doesn't normally happen when you do the contract, but it does normally happen when you get the escrow instructions in, and you're talking because escrow is going to need to draw a grant deed, and that grant deed is going to take the property. Mr. and Mrs. Seller hereby grants to Sally Smith, a single woman. Okay? Well, why do they put single woman? Well, they put single woman because Sally told you, or she certainly, you know, she's young. She's, she's 21 years old. You just assumed. You didn't see a wedding ring, so you tell title, hey, she's a single gal. So they write up a grant deed, Sally Smith, single woman. Only to find out five days before close of escrow, Sally's already been married and divorced before her 21st birthday. What has to happen to the grant deed? It has to be modified because she's not a single woman. She's an unmarried woman. Um, as far as advising buyers to hold title as it relates to joint tenancy or tenants in common or so on and so forth, we don't make that advice. Mm -hmm. That needs to be done. And again, they don't have to make that decision at the time they're writing the offer. They need to make that decision early on in the escrow process, okay? Certainly before close of escrow. And the, the, the language that we give to the buyer is, if you have some questions or concerns about that, you need to seek legal advice. Once you've determined how you're gonna hold title, you need to let the escrow holder know, okay? Or let me know and I'll let the escrow holder know. You're going to sign documents that say how you're going to hold title. So you do have issues with tenants in common, joint tenancy, you know, that's, that sort of stuff. But the, the unmarried people, the single people, that's pretty simple. Unmarried man, or if I'm a married person, I've got a whole title. And that, by the way, those are the type of questions you want to ask, okay? Hopefully not necessarily at the day you're writing the offer. Hopefully you've developed some relationship with the buyer and you've asked them well prior to writing the offer. Oh, hey, so you guys, you're going to hold, you know, she's, she's a young lady, okay? Ask the, the silly questions. I know you're only 21 years old, but you're going to be buying this yourself. Yeah, 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 yeah. You've, have you been married before? I'm not trying to hit on you. Have you been married? No, I haven't been married before. Okay, great. Now we know something, right? Sally Smith, single woman, okay? What if she says, oh, well, no, actually, I am. Oh, and you're taking title by yourself, right? Oh, well, I'm saying, well, no, but I, I think I'm going to, um, I think me and my brother are going to. Oh, well, when were you going to let me know that? Oh, well, did I need to let you know when I wrote the offer? I, I couldn't just add him on before the very end? Or I need my mom as a co-signer, or my dad, or my ex-husband, or I'm still married. I'm married, but I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to buy this property this is just sold and separate. These are the type of questions and the conversations you need to be having with your buyer. Frankly, if you're not having them before you write the offer, you certainly do need to have it here. Okay? Oh, gosh, dang. I, I probably should have asked you this a long time ago, but you're the only one on title, right? You're not married, right? So on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So. We're going to get into more on that specific question when we talk about escrow instructions and preliminary title reports, a different class. So at any rate, sale buyer's property. Nothing's been checked here, but the fact that they underlined this, this causes me a little bit of concern. Okay? Why was this underlined? It looked to me like we had a property that was um, um, part of the um, um, 1031 exchange. It looked to me like they already had the money in the bank. 
now I'm questioning. You go back to the letter. Let's go back. Let's go back. Again, I got my detective hat on. We've got this letter. I'm looking at this letter, and this says, is in receipt of funds. Okay? Then I look at this line that's underlined under the contingency sale of a buyer's property, and it's underlined. It makes me wonder. Are they really in receipt of funds? Okay, I don't know. Now I'm a little bit unsure about that. Okay, but at any rate, they've underlined that. And by the way, we're going to take a break here, just a couple of minutes, um, and um, then we'll, we'll do part two of the class. So if anybody's wondering if you do the restroom or anything like that. Um, anyway, time periods and contingency removals, nothing's been checked. So, and again, different format than the new contract. I got it. But the language is the same. Seller, seller has seven days to do certain things, provide disclosures. Buyer has 17 days. Nothing's been changed there, so I'm okay with that. Um, buyer's effect removal of contingencies. Nothing's been changed. The buyer has, however, initial liquidated damages. Liquidated damages, again, I'm not going to explain liquidated damages here. Go to the contract class. The buyers have initial the liquidated damages clause. We will more than likely be recommending to our seller to sign the liquidated damages clause. Let's go back. Liquidated damages refers to deposits. What happens to the deposit if there's a dispute? Specifically in this case, what happens to the buyer's deposit? How much deposit do we have? We have $2,000, maybe, or we have $52,000. Let's go back to our theme. Our theme is what do we want to be able to do with this offer when we're writing this offer for the buyer? We want to be able to give the agent the listing agent an offer that can be accepted without counter, correct? Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things I personally think would be a problem with this is we have an offer price of $260,000 with, let's forget about this mistake right here, but we have a $2,000 deposit on a $260,000 purchase price, which by my math is less than 1%, okay? So we have less than a 1% deposit on a $260,000 purchase price. That's the equivalent to about an $800 deposit on a $100,000 purchase price. All right? So let's go back to liquidated damages. And generally, liquidated damages says that in the event there's a default on the part of the buyer, the seller agrees that the damages are one of two things. The actual amount of the deposit, two grand, or an amount not to exceed 3% of total purchase price. So in this particular case, if the buyer, excuse me, if the seller accepts this offer as written, forget about all the other mistakes, and if the buyer bails out, the maximum amount of money that the seller would be entitled to as damages is two grand. Okay? On a purchase price of $260,000, in my opinion, that ain't enough. Okay, a minimum deposit. Again, I'm writing this offer with my buyer's hat on, or my buyer's agent hat on, and I want to present an offer that can be what? Accepted without change and without counter by the listing agent and, of course, the seller. If I give them a low deposit, is that something potentially that the seller and the listing agent may discuss and may want to counter? Now, we can argue whether $2,000 is too low on a $260,000 purchase price, but even though I'm representing the buyer, and it may sound like, wait a minute, Lance, it sounds like you're talking about the seller's interest, not the buyer's interest. I'm representing the buyer. I want to get my buyer's offer accepted with no change to the offer if I possibly can. Okay? If I think that my buyer's offer will look stronger with a 3% earnest money, which will it, will this offer look better with a $7,500 deposit as opposed to a $2,000 deposit? Of course it will. So <clears throat> strictly from the negotiation and the presentation standpoint, I would encourage you all when you're writing offers for your buyers to get an earnest money deposit of 3% of the purchase price. Now, if you think, well, wait a minute, I don't want to tie up the money and I kind of feel like I don't have to do that, I can get it accepted for less, okay, maybe you're right. But writing an, an, a contract with, a, with an earnest money deposit which is less than 1%, which is the case in this offer, I think your minimum has got to at least be 1%, 1.5%, but honestly, I think you should shoot for 3 
Okay, I think you should shoot for three. So again, I have another issue on the deposit. If I if I love the offer in its entirety, if my seller said that the only thing on here that I didn't like was the two thousand dollar deposit, I would say, geez, I just wish it was more. I wish maybe we want to counter back. Let's get them more serious. Let's counter them with a three percent earnest money deposit. But they didn't do that. Okay, now of course we've got liquidated damages and arbitration, which the buyer initial. That's fine. I'm just scrolling through the rest of this. Nothing's been checked. However, they did write in here, which I love this. For all the mistakes that they made, they took the time to type in property to be professionally clean and free of debris. I mean, that's, you know, I mean, okay, there's nothing wrong with putting that in there. Okay? But, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. I mean, you took the extra time, which probably she didn't. This is probably a boilerplate offer that she uses on everything. Who knows? But with all the mistakes, we take the time to put that in there. Um, and again, so far, I think we're like at eight or nine issues on our counter offer that we have to draft so far. Definitions, where do we go? Oops. Um, okay, we're getting close to the end. Um, oh, which, by the way, listing agent. Who's the, it says Lance Martin up there. I was the listing agent on this particular property. Um, on her side, she put the name of her company, Remax 2000, in her name. On our side, it says Lance Martin. Is Lance Martin the brokerage house? No. Now, I have to counter that. The listing agent is not Lance Martin. The listing agent is Coldwell Banker Pioneer Real Estate broker. Lance Martin is the agent. Okay? But, again, it's a silly mistake. Don't make those mistakes. If everything else on the offer was perfect, would I have to change this? Would I have to counter this? Yes, I would. It has to be cleaned up. Now, well, a lot of agents know oh, that's silly. Don't even bother about that. Um, yeah, they probably would, but it's a contract, right? And by the way, what are we talking about here? We're talking about agency. Is agency a big deal? Agency is a big deal. Now, let's suppose for a minute that the, she got the name correct. Did one of these boxes have to be checked? Mm -hmm. yep. Who is Lance Martin representing? Nobody. Who is the buyer's agent representing? Nobody. Careless. Careless mistakes. I think that gets to item number nine or ten now on the counter offer that we have to generate. Okay? Um, I'm on page eight. Again, old offer, the language basically is the same. Who is the only person that can receive acceptance or counter of this offer? That person right there. The buyer is the only person that can receive acceptance or counter of this offer. Let's read it really quickly. Expiration of the offer. This offer shall be deemed revoked, and the deposit shall be returned unless offer is signed by seller, and a copy of the signed offer is personally received by the buyer. Comma. Blank. The only way for this offer for me as the listing agent to accept this offer and convey acceptance is for me to somehow personally get the signed acceptance to the buyer. Is that common? Of course not. Who do we normally give acceptance to? The buyer's agent, whose name needs to be listed in this line, which it is not listed on that line. Again, careless, okay? Is it important that the buyer date the offer when they yes. sign it? Very it important. is. Everything on the contract is important that they date it when they sign it. Okay, so um, this is, and we've spent about an hour going over how not to write an offer. Okay, um, when we're negotiating, and there's a couple different facets to negotiating an offer, now, there, there's, there's a certain amount of negotiation, so to speak, between the buyer's agent and the buyer. And it's maybe not really negotiation isn't the right word, maybe it's more of a collaboration. What are we going to do? Let me advise you on the best way to write an offer based upon what you've told me. Price, financing, items that you need repaired, so on and so forth. Having said that, 90% of what's in here is stuff that the buyer really doesn't understand. Buyer understands a couple of things. What's the price? When am I going to close? What are my closing costs? Okay. Is the roof going to have a, is the roof going to leak? There's dozens and dozens and dozens of things in here that the buyer is going to need your input on, whether it's title or vesting, okay? 
And some of them revolve around writing a clean offer. Some of them revolve around, find, well, again, we don't know when this particular offer is going to close because we don't actually have a closing date. We don't know when it's going to close. But let's assume um, we had a date in here that said January 15th. We talked about this in the contract class. Let's suppose it says January 15th. Is that a target date or is that a contract date? It is a contract date. You know, I joke around all the time. You call the buyer's agent, hey, we have a scheduled close of escrow of January 15th. How are we doing? Shooting for it. Shooting for it. You're shooting for it? That to me indicates that if you miss, no big deal, I'll shoot again. Or maybe the 16th is okay. Or I said, well, that's no big deal. We only missed it by a week. What's the big problem? Well, depending upon the seller and the terms of the contract, shooting for it and missing could mean the difference between this particular buyer getting this house or not getting this particular house. Big problem. And if your agents are shooting for something and missing, and they ultimately cause a buyer or seller to be in breach of contract, and that ultimately causes them to lose the property, who is potentially liable for the buyer's loss or the seller's loss? Their agent. Okay? I'll give you a, a, what may sound like a silly example. Let's, let's go back and do this one. Let's go back to, let's pretend for a moment that this had the agent's name, buyer's agent Sally Smith in here. The way the default is written is that the seller has um, three days from the date that the offer is um, executed, which we're going to assume it was September 20th of 2005. Um, this offer shall de be deemed revoked unless a signed copy is returned and received by the buyer or the buyer's agent who is authorized to receive it. If they don't get it by 5 p.m. on the third calendar day after the offer is signed, when was the offer signed? When was the offer signed? You can't tell. No we don't know. <laughs> now we can assume September 20th. What happens when we get in court and we sit back and say, well, Your Honor, we assume that the buyer signed the contract on September 20th. Not good. And the honor is going to say, well, it appears as though somebody wrote it on September 20th, but we don't know when they signed it. Right? Problem? Problem. But let's pretend it says September 20th in here. So when does this offer expire and when is it deemed revoked? We start counting the day after. 21st, 22nd, 23rd, 5 p.m. Okay? Are you with me? Someone shaking their head no? You disagree? If it's on Saturday, then it goes to Monday. Third calendar day. It says calendar day. It doesn't say business day. Third calendar day. Calendar days conclude Saturdays and Sundays. Okay? You're not sure about that. We talked about this in the contract class. Um, definitions, does it have calendar day on here? Someone help me out. No. Do we H. see calendar day? H. 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 Days, not it says day prior. Oh, no. okay. um, it means calendar? a specified number of calendar days. Where it says it say right that? there, and that's the provision, you just got to read a little In farther. H days prior, it means a specified number of calendar days before the occurrence of the event specified, right. not counting the calendar date. Oh, yeah, but that yeah. doesn't talk about weekends. Okay. Doesn't say calendar days are calendar days. If it's on the calendar, it's a day. This includes weekends. This includes Saturdays and Sundays. So the bottom line is this offer is deemed revoked at 5 p.m. on the 23rd. We don't count the 20th. We count the 21st, 22nd, 23rd, third day, 5 p.m. Okay, let me give you a scenario. Let's pretend the offer is perfect. The offer is perfect. Okay? The buyer's agent gives me this... Um, I'm the listing agent, gives me the contract. I take the contract and I um, meet with my buyer. Let's pretend that I get the offer on Thursday, okay? So I have, a, I have Friday, Saturday, Sunday at 5 p.m. I have to relay some sort of acceptance back to the buyer by 5 p.m. Sunday, correct? Correct. All right. So I now get the offer. On Thursday, I call my seller and say, hey, let's get together. We have an offer. The seller says, great, can you come over right now, Thursday night? I'm like, no, I'm a little busy. Um, and tomorrow I'm a little bit busy too, but how about Saturday morning? Which, by the way, is not the appropriate way to handle that. If your seller says, yes, I'm available. Um, I'd like to meet with you tonight. Then you 
are available as well, and you meet with them tonight. Okay? Now, within reason, I've got other appointments, fine. Then, what, then my, my last appointment tonight is over at 9 p.m. Can I meet you at 9.30 p.m. at your home? That's how real estate is done, guys. Now, that might not be the way it's been done in the last few years. We send them to the bank and we wait three months and all the rest of that. That's going to go away here pretty soon. And we're going to go back to a traditional market. And real estate will again be done at 9, 10, 11 p.m. on Saturday night, on Thursday night, in sellers' homes. Okay? So at any rate, I tell my seller, no, I'm not available. Can't do it. I'm busy. I got things to do. I'll see you Saturday morning. Okay, so I meet with my seller Saturday morning. Let's again, let's pretend the offer's perfect. We sign the acceptance. The seller signed, they love it. No counter off or nothing, okay? We sign, but about they date. When do they date it? Saturday morning, that's, let's, what's that gonna be? The 21st, second, third, 22nd? That's gonna be the 22nd, okay? And they sign it and they accept it and it's great. Now, what do I need to make sure happens what do I need to make sure happens before Sunday at 5 p.m.? I need to get this acceptance to the buyer's agent, right? Yeah. Yeah. I need to make sure they got it, right? Mm -hmm. To confirm acceptance. But just as I was lazy on setting the appointment to meet with my seller, I'm now just as lazy. Now that I've got it signed, I'm geez, you know, I think I might go to Vegas. You know? <laughs> so I jump in my car, I go to Vegas, and I think, oh, you know, I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to email this contract to the agent, you know, I'll get it done, and then I have a long night on Saturday, and Sunday I wake up, I'm not feeling so good, and it's now Sunday afternoon, and it's, nah, gee, oh shoot, it's 5.01, okay, I send this contract back to the buyer's agent, and what happens? Buyer's agent said, well, no, not in that particular case, okay. we said they accepted another offer. We go back to the buyer's agent, the buyer's agent says, eh. I'm not interested. Oh, we had an offer on another property. Had a whole bunch of other things. Well, all of which may be true, and all of which may, may have no bearing on my story. But at five, at 4:59 on Sunday, was the buyer and their deposit contractually obligated to buy this house? Mm -hmm. At 5:01 on Sunday, with no acceptance relayed was the buyer and their deposit contractually obligated to buy this house? No. No. So forget about the practical side of, hey, they were going to cancel anyway, no big deal. Let's go to the real life side. And the real life side says, you've now missed it. You've missed the deadline. The buyer's agent says, ah, forget it. We weren't really that serious anyway. All right? So what do you get to do? You get to call, who do you get to call as the listing agent? I get to call my seller, who thought that they accepted an offer on Saturday morning, right? And I get to call them and say, oh, hey, you know, I hate to tell you, but, you know, the buyer, um, they changed their mind. Don't worry about it, though. I'm going to hold an open house next week, and I'm going to resell it, and everything's fine. And you're just about ready to hang up, and your seller who's read the contract, mm -hmm. and obviously you have it, buyer's agent, listing agent, your seller's read the contract and says, oh, when are you going to send me their deposit? <laughs> what do you mean? Well, you just said that the buyer just changed their mind. They didn't want the property. Where in the contract does it say the buyer gets to change their mind? Now it says appraisal, loan contingencies, inspection, so on and so forth. It doesn't just say they get to change their mind. So the seller says, I've read the contract. I had a fully accepted contract Saturday morning when we met yesterday, listing agent. I know that the buyer's blown up, and you know what? We're probably better off for it. Rather have them cancel the day than 30 days into escrow. But you know what? I'm kind of a stickler when it comes to the contract. I think I want my two grand. Well, you know you're not going to get it anyway. You have to fight over it. That's okay. I'm willing to fight over it because it has to be somewhere. A contract says there's $2,000 at risk. Now, of course, you're the listing agent. You're tap dancing left and right because you do not want to tell your seller 
that who failed to relay acceptance to the buyer in a timely fashion? Yeah. Who did that? I did that. So now instead of the seller being upset with the buyer, who they should be upset with, now they're upset with you because you haven't done your job. Right? You have not done your job. Okay? Let me give you a different example. Okay? Now I represent the buyer. I submit this offer. I submit it on the 20th. I send it over to the listing agent. It gets to the listing agent. Okay? The buyer now calls me, which happens all the time. Buyer calls me up the next morning and says, eh, really having second thoughts. Please cancel, withdraw my offer. Can the buyers do that? Yes, they can. They can, they can withdraw any time they want prior to acceptance and this property being received back by them. They call their agent up, the buyer's agent, and say, I'm done. Take me out. We're disappointed. We're upset. You're wasting my time, so on and so forth. Now, what do we need to do? We need to relay that withdrawn offer, preferably in writing, to the listing agent and turn the seller immediately. But we go to Vegas. We forget. We have the best intentions of the world of relaying that back to the buyer, excuse me, to the listing agent and the seller. In the meantime, what happens? That offer gets what? Accepted. That offer then gets sent back to who? The name's in here, the listing agent. And now I open up my email and I have an accepted offer that was actually withdrawn by my buyer 24 hours earlier. So now what do I get to do? I need to call the listing agent up and I say, oh, I'm so sorry, we withdrew, da 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 da. Like, well, wow, when did you, when did you withdraw? Just a little bit of motion to make that work. When did you, well, we withdrew, you know, actually yesterday, Listing agent is upset for a bunch of reasons. You wasted my time, yada, 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 yada. But what has the listing agent and the seller done? They have properly relayed acceptance, and they have properly relayed acceptance back to the authorized party, who is the listing agent, or excuse me, the buyer's agent, and in turn have contractually obligated the buyer to buy a house which the buyer rightfully withdrew prior to acceptance, but their agent didn't relay that. Now who's in trouble? Now the buyer's agent's the one who's in hot water. Is this serious stuff? Yes. Guys, I know it's real easy to get your real estate license, and it's real easy to practice real estate. This is serious stuff. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, so often, we just blow right by it, no big deal, not no urgency. Like I've said before, and it's, it's a pet peeve of mine, this is a contract. We need to scratch that agreement word out, and we need to put contract in big, bold letters, and we need to be fearful of every single sentence and word in this contract because it's obligating people to do certain things. And as much as the consumers may think that us realtors are making a lot of money and boy, 6% commissions a lot and all the rest of that sort of stuff, for the amount of responsibility and liability that we take on in these transactions, you can completely wipe away your portion of a commission and the broker's portion of the commission and the entire commission with just one line in this contract, okay? So, getting, I, want to, I want to show you a, a, a different one. And again, it's been a long time since I've, since I've taught this um, class. But this offer, this was written by a Keller Williams agent. Again, this is a 2007 offer. This is what I'm deeming a, a better offer. I'm calling this good offer. I'm sure there's probably a mistake or two in it. And I'm very, very quickly going to buzz through this. We're going to spend very little time going through it. But I've got a nice cover letter written by this agent. Um, you know, it's telling me I've got FICO scores in the, whatever, um, 756. Um, um, well, there's a flashback to the past. The branch manager of Countrywide said they were golden, which used to mean something. Um, so um, that used to be a big deal. They've written, this was actually a counteroffer that was written. This was actually the counteroffer that we wrote. But even with a good offer, we only had three items that we had to put together on our counter. We countered a price, 
Okay, that's going to happen. We countered some closing costs, and we were very clear on what those were going to be. And we seller agrees to leave existing furniture, appliances, and water softening. It's a strange deal selling it semi-furnished. Well, let's take a look at the actual buyer's offer. This is a net sheet. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Okay, this is the buyer's offer. Um, so I know who my buyer is. I have a date. I have a closing date of 45 days. We talked in the contract class. I don't particularly like that. I personally prefer hard dates. We are going to close on a certain date and time, but we were okay with 45 days. Not real thrilled with these numbers being written in here, but they were written in. Um, $3,000 deposit. A $3,000 deposit on a purchase price of $330, still less than 1%. Not overly thrilled with that. There should be a price in here. And again, I'm calling this a good offer, but there's still some blanks in here. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, basic, basic stuff. Um, we've got, what else do we have in here? Well, we've got our seller's choice for the term right. Okay? They check the box for the WPA. Simple stuff. That was one of the mistakes on the last offer that we looked at. They've gone through. <coughs> um, they didn't ask for things that don't apply. They didn't ask for septic. They didn't ask for sewer. Um, they didn't ask for wells to be tested. Okay? Common sense stuff. Um, so the last one, we had a silly mistake on who was going to pay for the home warranty. Um, actually, oops, do we have the same silly mistake? <clears throat> same silly mistake, you know. And actually, it's kind of strange. I don't think we countered that. Um, here's our border plate, rest of the contract. We've got the agents in here correctly. Cobalt Banker Pioneer is representing the seller. Keller Williams is representing the buyer. Now, it sounds so elementary. David Robinson's the buyer's agent. I know who to communicate for. I got to tell you, there are agents who have been doing this for years and years and years and are making these basic mistakes. If for no other reason, they're either incompetent or just haven't taken the time to read the contract and fill out the boxes. Okay? This is not that complicated. Okay? Um, so one thing on the closing costs, I'm curious. It's been a while since I've looked at this specific contract. Let me go back here and see. Okay. Seller to pay $12,000 towards buyer's closing costs. We talked about that in the contract class. Okay. If you notice on the counter offer that I wrote, and if I was writing this offer for a buyer, that's okay with me, but I want to be specific. And this is what I did on our counter. We were... Okay, seller will pay the twelve thousand bucks. We're going to give it to you. Okay, I, I love these words, including but not limited to. What are we going to pay for? What are we not going to pay for? Well, we'll pay for the buyer's portion of the escrow and title. Does buyers have portions of the title insurance? Yes, we talked about that in the contract class. You've got to take a look at that. We'll pay the home warranty. We had to apparently count on that because remember they forgot to check the box. Okay, and we'll pay other fees that may be lender required. That's it. Okay, so let's suppose that the lender fees. Let, let's just pretend for a moment that these everything but the lender fees add up to four thousand bucks. Okay, so we have eight thousand dollars of lender fees, and let's suppose we get to escrow and escrow, and lender sends over their demand for fees, and let's suppose that the fees are five thousand. Well, there's $3,000 on the table. Well, the way we've written the counter, where's the $3,000 go? $3,000 go accrue to the benefit of the seller. We're not going to give it. Just, you just can't willy-nilly take the money. Oh, well, we're going to put it over here. We're going to put it over here. We're going to give it back in the form of a credit, which most of the lenders aren't going to allow anyway. So we want to be tight. We want to be clean. So the moral of the story on these type of offers is, is basically... You want to write offers that can be accepted, as I've said 17 times in this class. They need, you need to write offers that can be accepted by the seller as written. And if they're not going to be accepted as written, you only want to be arguing over the big points. You want to be arguing over the price, okay? How much in closing costs are we going to pay, you know? 
We don't want to be having a 16-page counteroffer form that says you forgot to check this box or you forgot to do that or you forgot to do this because you're just asking for trouble as throughout the entire process. Okay. Now I'm just going to leave this up on the screen, but let, let's throw out a couple of scenarios here in the last half hour of this class. Okay, I think we're at the title of our class is Offer Negotiations and Presentations. So far all we've really kind of discussed is the negotiation process, but we've discussed the negotiation process mostly as it relates to the buyer and their own agent. We're negotiating with ourselves. Okay? Let's assume for a moment that we've written a good, clean offer. We've asked the buyer all of the appropriate questions. How are they going to hold title? The pre qualified they've, they've, they've been solidly qualified um, by our lender. Their income has been verified. Their employment has been verified. Their um, down payment has been, source of funds has been verified. By the way, everybody understand that that's different. A buyer's income and source of funds necessarily are not the same thing. Income is my job. I have a job. This is where I get my income. I need income in order to qualify to make a monthly payment. I work at, at Ralph's. They pay me X amount of dollars a month. That's my income. It's enough to qualify for the house. Okay? My employment is tied to my income. I'm verifying employment. Well, where do I work? Well, I work at Ralph's. Is that verifiable? Okay? In other words, if we send an employment verification to Ralph's, will they say that you work there? Will they also say that you make the money per month that you say you make? Will they also say that the money you make every month is your salary? What does that mean? In other words, assuming you maintain your employment at Ralph's and you say you make $4,000 a month at Ralph's, do you make $4,000 a month every month? If they report back, well, no, because that includes overtime, and overtime, unless it can be established for extended periods of time, cannot be included as income. Well, no, the, the real salary is $2,400 a month. You've been benefiting for this overtime for the last two months, but it's not steady. So the employer says, yes, we will verify employment, but we cannot verify all of the income that the buyer said that they make because they're not guaranteed that income every month. You need to understand that. And then you also have depositor source of funds. Well, that's different. The depositor source of funds is, well, how much money do you have in the bank? That's different than income. If the loan requires a $20,000 down payment, verification of funds requires, do you have $20,000 in the bank? And then maybe a little bit more for what? Closing costs and other fees. You guys need to ask all of these questions and then a whole bunch more to your buyer. And ideally, you're not asking them this at the time you're writing the offer. Or if you are, you're being very thorough in that. If you want to, you're out showing property. Be the professional. Where are you working? Can it be verified? That, 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 that. By the way, let's get the loan application going right now. Let's get the employment verified. Let's get the income verified. Let's get your money verified. If you have buyers that will not tell you where their source of funds is coming from, you don't have a buyer. Are you going to put money down? Yes, I'm paying cash. Cash? Wow, you just made the process so much easier. No verification of income. No verification of employment. All we need is what? Verification of deposit. Verification of source of funds. You're paying cash. Where am I getting it? Ask the questions. You know, it's in the bank. Can I have a, a proof of funds? You don't trust me? It's nothing to do with whether I trust you. Of course I trust you. You've hired me to represent you as your agent. I want to make sure what you're going to be able to provide me as proof of funds is going to be sufficient to satisfy the seller. What have you got? I have a bank statement from Bank of America that says I have $400,000 and I have a $330,000 purchase price. Hmm. Is the money liquid? What do you mean? Can you take, could you go to the bank today and pull that money out of that account, put it in escrow today in the form of a cashier's check, certified funds, or have the bank wire it, and close escrow tomorrow? Well, I could, but I don't want to do that. Why? Because it's in a CD, and a CD doesn't mature for four months. 
okay, that's fine. Are you telling me that you are not prepared to close escrow until four months from now? That's exactly what I'm telling you. Okay? Is that a problem? It's not a problem. But you're now out showing the buyer property. The buyer has now just told you that I'm looking today, but I'm telling you right now, I'm not, I cannot close for four months. So then you need to ask him the question, well, what if I find the property for you today that is exactly the property that you've been telling me you want? Are you telling me you are not prepared to write an offer on this property today unless you have a four-month escrow? Yeah, that's kind of what I'm saying. Well, you know what? It's probably not a good idea then for you and I to go out and look at property today. You don't want to show me property? I didn't say that. <laughs> What I said is I don't want to show you property today because if this house is what you want and it's everything you desire and it's a good house that's market value and worth buying, is that property going to be available four months from now? No. You are then for wasting my time. In our contract class, I think we talked about this during the class, if we may be repeating ourselves a little bit. I think it is absolutely imperative that you as the buyer's agent Take a moment very early on in your relationship with the buyer and explain to them how you get paid, okay? And there's no better time to explain that to them than in the conversation that you just had. Oscar, you're going to wait four months before you're going to buy this property. Let me tell you why we probably shouldn't be looking at properties necessarily today. I'll email you a list, I'll send you this sort of stuff. I want to service you, trust me, I don't want to push you aside. But let, let, let me share a few things with you. First of all, if you find a house that you want today and you're not prepared to buy it, the, chance, the seller is not going to accept a four-month escrow. We're literally wasting your time and my time. And you know, this would be a good opportunity for me to explain to you actually how I get paid as your, as your broker, as your agent. Okay? You would be amazed how many buyers do not understand how we get paid. Explain to them, number one, I've had buyers tell me that they thought I just got an hourly wage. I've had buyers tell me that they actually were afraid to call me back and write an offer because they didn't have the money to pay me. Okay? Oh my gosh, that's why you haven't been returning my phone calls? I thought we hit it off. We love, we... You guys, you didn't think, you, that's not how I get paid. You're not going to pay me, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer. Oh, and by the way, no, I don't get an hourly wage from my broker at the office. I get paid upon commission. I get paid upon close of escrow. I am the professional. I, this is how I get paid. I get paid out of seller's proceeds. If we have a successful transaction, my compensation as the buyer's agent comes from the, the seller. Okay? You don't have to cut me a check. You're never going to have to cut me a check. And by the way, you need to have the same conversation with some of your sellers on the listing appointments. Especially in today's market with a lot of the short sales. There's a, one of the reasons a lot of sellers, I believe, are not listing their properties as short sales right now is because a lot of them think they have to pay in advance the commissions and they don't have the commissions. If you have the ability to explain to them the commissions are built into the sales process. You will never write me a check. If the bank successfully agrees to your short sale, the bank will absorb the commissions as part of the deal. Okay? We just assume that the consumers understand how we get paid. And I know they don't. And you know how I know that they don't understand it? It's because I have brand new agents come into this office every day, maybe a little bit of an overstatement, but certainly multiple times a year, We'll sit in front of my desk or we'll sit in front of the manager's desk and when we talk to them about their expectations and all the rest of that, you ask a couple, three questions and these are people that have taken the time to study and pass the real estate exam and they don't understand how they get paid <coughs> and they've got their real estate license. They really are clueless on how Realtors get paid, oh, which by the way, the term is Realtors, okay? We are not Realtors, so please catch yourself. If you, it, it, it's, it's For some reason, it's kind of natural for people to say Realtors, I'm a Realtor. We are not Realtors, we are Realtors. There's no A between the L and the T, okay? 
drives me mad. If you are one of my agents and I catch you saying that, I will embarrass you in front of God and everybody. You know, you know, we've had the I've had presidents of the Association of Realtors, the president of an association of realtors, say, uh, and, and us realtors are going to do the following. Okay, I mean, we're realtors, realtors, kind of like a doctor, not a doctor. Okay, anyway, I'm off the top. Okay, so anyway, explain to your clients how we get paid. It will go a long way towards them understanding. Um, the process and especially when you're working with those buyers okay now I've got a little off point but we've now discussed the buyers we've asked them as many of the questions as we can the title questions the vesting questions where's the money coming from who are you mm -hmm. what's your name do you have a middle initial do you spell your name differently are you really Louis or are you Lewis how do you expect to hold title are you Tony or are you Anthony is that a big deal? It's a very big deal. Are you single or are you unmarried? Is it a big deal? It's a very big deal. Okay? Um, well, I don't understand. I'm single. I divorced my wife six years ago. You are not single. You are unmarried. Okay? Ask the questions. Where's the money coming from? Can you really close on December 15th or January 15th? There's dozens of questions that need to be asked. And you need to know where they are. And you know where to find them? Read the contract. All of the questions that you need to ask are in the contract. Every single one of them. If you read the contract, let's just grab one for example. Uh, where's the, how about this one? Conditions. Again, this is an older contract. A little bit older, but it basically says the same thing. Are you prepared to take this property as is in its present condition? That is a question that needs to be asked to your buyer. Now you can ask them three days before close of escrow. You can ask them when you're writing the offer. Or ideally, when should you ask them that question? How about when you're at the property? I'm at the property. There's a little bit of excitement going on. Hey, you guys look really excited about this. Is this an offer that you'd be, or a property that you'd be interested in making an offer on? Which, by the way, we're going to do an entire other class on, on sales skills and closing skills. Okay? If you are not asking that question to your buyers regularly, I mean almost at every property, you need to probably ask at least one of two questions to your buyers every single time you show them a property. Huh. You think this might be something you write an offer on? Pause. Wait for answer. Okay. Let them answer the question. Don't do what I tend to do. Don't talk too much. Oh, well, if you did think you were going to write an offer, how much do you think? Oh, and what the... Just shut up. Do you think that this might be a property that you would write an offer on? No. Hmm. Why? Shut up. Wait for answer. And then listen. Okay? Because it faced east. Okay. Just to be clear, if the property didn't face east, would this be a property you would be prepared to write an offer on? Yes. Aha! So, the only problem with this property is it faced east. Everything else you're good with, the bedroom count, the size, the lot size, the neighborhood, the school district, the city, the blah, 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 okay? Yeah. So the next obvious question is, so if I found you a property similar to this that didn't face east, would you buy it? Well, no. Okay, well, what's the other problem? Well, it can't face south or north either. Okay, so if I find you a property that looks exactly like this, so it's very similar to this, and it faced to the west, you would buy it. Yes. Great. Now I know what to show you. And I'll tell you what, the rest of the properties that I have slated for you today don't meet that criteria. I'll tell you what, rather than waste your time and my time, let me go back to the office. I'm going to search new properties that meet this criteria that face west. I will give you a call back in a few hours and we'll reschedule an appointment for this afternoon or tomorrow or Saturday or Sunday. 
Now, I just saved an entire day of showing property to buyers that they wouldn't want. All because I'm asking them some very basic closing questions. Now, you can call this salesmanship. Um, you know, I, 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 I don't want to in any way, shape, or form compare us to you know, car dealers or anything like that. But there is some sales associated in this business. And done professionally, it's what needs to be done. Ask them the question, are, is this a property that you would be interested in writing an offer on today? You would be amazed where that will lead you. Getting back to my example on the contract, which is why if you have the contract memorized, all of the questions will be answered for you, or the questions that you need to ask will be answered. There, you're going to have them, an hour later, you're going to go back to the office and you're going to have them sign this that says they're willing to take it in its present condition. If you haven't already addressed this question with them, you're going to have to address it at some point. So, if we, you are interested in buying this property, yes, it's perfect. Is there anything about it that, I mean, are you, willing to, are you then saying you're willing to accept it in its present condition? Well, I didn't say that. I said I like the property, but we, the carpet. Oh, well, what? Because that's not that's it. so. You're telling me if we write an offer on this property today, we need to deal with the carpet in one form or another, new carpet, so on and so forth. Or you can answer it a different way. Hmm. Okay. Well, let me ask you this: If you were able to get it for a price of X, would you be willing to accept it in its present condition with the carpet as it currently stands? Right. This is professional real estate sales, folks. If you are showing property to buyers and opening the door and walking through and, you know, hey, look at <laughs> oh, what do you think? Okay, great, I got six more. That's cool. Okay? That is not how this is done. Okay? We are not cab drivers. We are not, this is not, uh, 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 we do not get paid to show people property. We get paid to write contracts and sell them. Okay? Asking the right question. Let's just randomly, matter of fact, let's just stay on the exact same page. Um, here we go. Items included and excluded. Okay? Let's pretend this property has a swimming pool. And we're walking back to the swimming pool and we see a whole bunch of pool equipment. And we say, oh, you, you kind of indicate you might be interested in this property. I see a whole bunch of pool equipment here on this property. Okay? I do, have you ever owned a property with a swimming pool? Yes, I have. Mm, okay, cool. Uh, do you, I mean, it looks like there's a whole bunch of equipment here. Is that important to you? Yes. What, what do you mean? Is, it, is all of this pool equipment here? There's a sweeper, and there's a sucker, and there's a thing, and there's a net. You know, is that important to you? No, it's not important to me. I have a pool, and I own a pool company. I'm going to get rid of all of it. Okay? Or, well, of course it's important to me. That comes with the house, doesn't it? Maybe. Maybe not. Okay, so you're telling me if we're writing an offer on this property, we need to get the pool equipment. Right? And maybe get the carpet replaced. Oh, I see that the um, fence is falling down over there. Are you prepared to take the property with the fence falling down? Or do we have to get the fence fixed? You know where I'm going with this. Okay, present condition. Included, excluded. Buyer's vesting. We talked, Michael brought that up earlier. We got down here at the bottom. You know, why would you want to wait? Why would you want to wait until you're writing the offer? Why? That's an easy question to ask. Oh, by the way, how do you plan on holding title? What do you mean? Well, I'm, you know, we don't really know each other that well. Are you husband and wife? No. Okay, I don't mean to be personal, but are you both going to go on title? Yes. Either one of you been married before? Well, that's kind of personal. Why do you want to know that? Well, it's important to the vesting. It's part of the contract. Uh, I'm divorced, and she's single, and boy, boy, you just really brought up a sore subject. Well, I'm sorry that I brought up a sore subject. Do you want to buy a house or not? Do you, did you never plan on telling your girlfriend that you're divorced? Or maybe you're not divorced. Maybe you haven't been divorced yet. Okay? And now you've got a big event happening right in front of the house. You've got them fighting. Well, he hasn't even been divorced. Okay. Now, as uncomfortable as that may be, would you rather have that happen today than after going through all of this work and all of this trouble and all the rest of this sort of stuff we are professionals. We ask the professional questions. If the buyers can't handle it, they're not buyers. Okay? We want a buyer who can handle that. Repairs. 
The contract says that unless we ask for repairs, we're not going to do any repairs. It sounds like we're going to write an offer on this property. Let's take another look real quick. Let's walk through it one more time. I want you to make sure that you're comfortable purchasing this property with no repairs. Because if you're not, what are we going to do? We're going to put it into the contract. And we're going to ask for the fence that's fallen over needs to be repaired or replaced or whatever specifically we want. It, obviously the spa is empty and it looks like it hasn't worked in 10 years. Are you okay with that? I am okay with that. Great, then we're not going to mention that. Matter of fact, we are going to mention it. We're going to say, buyer agrees to accept spa in its current green condition. Right? Because buyers forget these things. Okay? So all of the questions that you need to ask your buyers are in the contract. And I would suggest the sooner you ask them the questions, the better. Do not wait to get in the conference room and start addressing these questions with your buyers because you will find out that most of your buyers are not buyers. Because when you start asking these questions, your deal's dead. Or you can do what's even worse. You never ask the questions at all. At some point, a buyer will come to you and say, would you please take me back to the office and write an offer on this house? No, oh, you want to write an offer? Okay. <laughs> and you'll come back with your tail between your legs and you're scared. Which, by the way, you know why a lot of salespeople don't ask buyers these questions and they don't ask the obvious question. If you ask one question and one question only, every time you see your buyer, you should ask them, would you be interested in writing an offer on this house? But a lot of agents don't ask that question. You know why they don't ask that question? They are afraid that the answer is going to be yes. I would like to write an offer on this house. Because if the answer is yes, then what? Then we have to go do this, okay? And I'm afraid of this. I don't know how to do this. And Lance has made it even more scary now because he took the word agreement off, which sounds so nice and pleasant. And he replaced it with the word contract. And I'm afraid and I don't know how to do it. So I really don't want these people to say yes. I want to pretend that I'm in the real estate business. Of course, nobody watching this video or in this room wants to pretend they're in the real estate business. So ask the questions. If you don't ask the questions and you do get to this point and you do fill out the contract and you haven't asked all of those other questions, when do the answers to those questions come up? They come up in escrow. Mm -hmm. And what if the answer to those questions are bad? What happens? Your escrow falls out. Yep. Who gets paid? Nobody. Nobody. And what have you done? You have wasted your time. And not only have you wasted your time, you have wasted the listing agent's time, you have wasted the seller's time, you've probably wasted at least a little bit of the lender's time, the title company's time, you've wasted a lot of people's time. And that's one reason that the, the level of professionalism in our business is, is in question. Because frankly, there's a lot of unprofessional realtors out there wasting people's time. So we're going to take about another 10 minutes and we're going to talk about the, the rest of the negotiation and the presentation, okay? We've now got an offer. We think we've written a good offer. We've asked all of the right questions. We've asked the buyer every possible thing we can. We're so confident not only with their motivation, their job, their income, their funds to close, the lender is in place, the closing dates are realistic, the contract is perfect. Okay, what do we need to do? Now again, this tape is being generated in, on December 6th of 2011. We're in a distressed market right now. REO, short sale, a little bit of standard sale, which used to be just sellers with equity. Okay, So right now, we've gotten into a habit of basically faxing into an offer to an unknown face emailing an offer to an unknown face, and we are accustomed to waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting, okay? Now, in most cases though, the, there is a face that you're sending that offer to. You may never get to see the seller. I pray for the day when the market returns, 
when I represent a buyer and I get to call the listing agent up and I get to call the listing agent up and say, hey, it's Lance Martin with Cobalt Banker Pioneer Real Estate. I have an offer on your listing at 123 Main Street. When would be a good time for us to meet with your seller? Has anybody even heard of that? If you're in the Not business lately. for a few years, you haven't even heard of it. Wait a minute. Did you just say that you're the buyer's agent and the listing agent are going to sit down and meet with the seller? That's exactly what I said. And that's how business used to be done. And I can't wait. If I, I don't know if it'll ever go back to that. But it is amazing. Think about how amazing it would be if most of us are representing buyers these days. How great would it be for you to sit at the kitchen table with the agent representing the seller and the seller, sit down, tell the seller all about your buyer. And you know all about them because you've asked all the questions. You have a competently written offer. You can tell them it's John and Sally Smith and they've got two kids and you won't believe it. They just they love the house and little Johnny's already picked up the bedroom upstairs and they have a trampoline that they want to put in the corner of the backyard and they're already going to the school down the street and their church is around the block and I gotta tell you and you may have met these people they came through and you, know, you guys I think you might have been here when the when they were looking at the things da, 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 da. You, is, is there some salesmanship with that of course there's some salesmanship with that then you go in and you present a competently well written offer you get a little bit of a dialogue with the listing agent and the seller. Maybe they ask you to leave the room for a little bit or they tell you to go out in the car. This is how it used to be done, guys. I'll tell you what, why don't you go outside, have a cigarette or do whatever you do. Let me talk to Mr. and Mrs. Seller for a few minutes. The listing agent would then talk to the seller and we would say, guess what? This offer is fantastic. We've got to sign this right now. Don't act too excited, okay? Let's get it signed. Let's go ahead and bring the agent back in here. Let's give it to them. Deliver it. Right? Remember that scenario we gave earlier? We're going to deliver an acceptance to them right now. Or, guess what? We agree on everything except price. Let's get them back in here. I tell you what, the offer is great. We're just about $10,000 apart. So, we'd like to give you a counter offer and get you up about $10,000. You know, what do you think? Well, I'll tell you what, you want to hold on 10 minutes? Yeah, let me go outside, let me call my buyer. That's how we used to do it. We go outside, we get on the phone. Hey, okay, by the way, it's 10.30 at night on Friday. Okay? And it's raining. And I'm now outside. I'm in my car. Hey, guess what? I'm over at the seller's house. We're 10 grand apart. They really like your offer. I told them all about the kids and the school, the dog and the trampoline. They want to come back at 3.10. What do you think? Okay. Are you telling me if I bring back the counter at 310, you're going to sign it? Yes. Great. I'm going to go back in right now. I'm going to have a draft a counter offer at 310. I'm going to be back. I'll see you. I know it's late, but I want you to start. Are you excited, right? Yeah, you're great. I'll be at your house by 1130. You want me to bring a hamburger? <laughs> Guys, this is how this business needs to be done. Now, Lance, come on, this is ridiculous. We don't, we're not in that world anymore. Are we not in that world? I'll tell you what. I understand we're writing offers to a lot of banks. Well, 99% of those offers are being submitted to agents. I'm one of those agents. Do you know how many realtors, 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 okay, practice. You know how many realtors will call me and say, Lance, I have just written an offer on your property on 123 Main Street. I understand it's a bank owned property, but I have never met you or I haven't seen you in five years. Would it be okay if I came by your office this afternoon, three o'clock or four o'clock be better? I'd like to just sit down with you for five minutes and either introduce myself or if I already know you, say hi. And I'd like to go over my offer with you. Who does that? If you're not doing that, you are missing the boat. Okay? You need to be calling these agents that are representing the banks, even if it's a short sale. And frankly, if it is a short sale and there's a real seller that has to approve that, 
do the first example I gave you. Hey, I've got an offer on your short sale. I'd like to sit down with you and your seller. Most of the agents will sit back and say, huh? What do you mean? We don't do that anymore. Well, would you consider it? I've been doing this for 25 years. Would you consider you and I and your seller sitting down so I can explain the benefits of my offer and why I think they should accept it? Ask them the question. Just because they're the listing agent doesn't make them God. Ask them the question. And I will tell you, most of them, especially the bank REO agents, even though they're, no, they don't want to be nonsense. They don't want to meet you, show up in their office anyway. Show up in their office. Now, if their instructions are to send an email and follow all the rest, then send the email and follow all the instructions. Then show up in their office. Ask the receptionist, hey, this is Joe, I'm here to see Lance. What's it pertaining to? I just submitted an offer. You know, Lance says he wants all of his offers emailed in. I know, I already did. When did you do that? Ten minutes ago. Why are you here? I want to introduce myself. Why do you want to? I've never met him. I want to meet the person I'm going to go in escrow with. Oh, come on. There's 35 offers on the property. I know. Why do you think I'm here? <laughs> I'm here because there's 35 offers on the property. I want that son of a gun to give me three minutes of his time because I know there's 35 offers on the property. I want him to see that I am a professional. Mm -hmm. That I have got a clean shirt on, maybe a tie, maybe even a jacket. I want him to see that my offer is clean. I want him to see that I can articulate a sentence. I want him to see or her to see that I am a professional. Okay? Do you think that's going to make a difference? I'm telling you it makes a difference. Okay? As opposed to the alternative. The, the standard of practice today for agents submitting offers is they send an email and then they call three weeks later and say, I sent an offer in two weeks, three weeks, four weeks ago. I just thought I'd call in to see what you did with it. <laughs> when did you send it in? Three weeks ago. Boy, I'm, I'm really sorry. Have you been leaving me voicemails? Have you sent me emails? Have you... Is this... How many times have you tried to... Because I'm looking in the computer and I don't see an offer from you. Well, I emailed it. Okay. Well, did you, did you follow it up with the... Yeah, I followed up with the phone call. Right now. <laughs> you mean to tell me... Again, rewind the tape about 10 minutes. Buyers don't, and again, I don't mean to, to, to degrade anybody in the room or watching the tape. Buyers agents do not ask buyers questions because they are afraid that that might lead to a contract. I know it sounds silly, but I'm telling you, there are a lot of agents that are afraid to do this. Now they've done it. You think if they're a little bit shaky on writing the offer, you think they might be a little bit shaky in the negotiation and presentation process with the listing agent, who of course is the professional, the REO guy, don't want to look silly, I'm new in the business, don't want to embarrass myself in front of the, in front of the other agent. So what do they do? They take the path of least resistance. It says, email my offer in. That's what I've done. I've done my job. Call my buyer. We email the offer in. Well, when do you think we'll get an answer back? Oh, you know, these REOs these days, sometimes it takes two, three weeks. So if we don't hear anything in a couple weeks, call me back. Is that the right way to do business? Of course not. So when you're presenting these offers, you've taken the time to show the property, write the offer. You've done what the escrow, the, uh, the, uh, the MLS instructions say, you've emailed it in. I'm telling you, every single time, every single time, call the listing agent up. I'd like to come over. I, I just want three minutes of your time. Come on, Lance, I've known you for 25 years. We've closed 75 escrows together. I know. I guess you're right. I shouldn't have even called. I'll be there in five minutes. Okay? <laughs> I know you that well. I just show up. And to be honest, that's what you want. That's the relationship that you want. You want the relationship to be so that when you have done this for years, or just starting, and now you're sending that offer in to 
you know, Sally Smith, listing agent for Freddie Mac, that Sally Smith knows you. She knows you by name. And better yet, she knows you by face. Now, there's two ways to be known in this business. You can be known... Where's that other offer? Where's that terrible offer that we had? Anyway, you can be known as bad offer. Do you want that reputation? Do you want to write offers that when the listing agent sees that offer, they instantly say, who wrote this? Oh my God. Again? And then what are they going to do? They're going to talk to their seller, or they're going to put the notes in the bank. Hey, I know it says that the offer is for $300,000, but the thing is written terribly. The agent's incompetent. They don't know what they're doing. I recommend reject. As opposed to, you're either, in, there is really no in between in this business. You're either an unknown, which means you're probably bad, or you're a known and you're good. Okay? And from a presentation standpoint, you want to get yourself in front of, at a minimum, you want to get yourself in front of the listing agent. Okay? If you can, you're not going to get in front of the, the bank. That's a given. I understand that. But if there is a seller that is touchable, now if, and if it's a standard equity seller, you know, s firmly insist. I'd like to sit down with you and your seller. Why do you want to do that? I know it's old school. I want to do it. I want to explain to them the benefits of my offer. Could I please sit down with you and your seller this afternoon when they get home from work? If you don't ask, I guarantee you the answer is going to be no. Okay? So anyway, from a presentation standpoint, get yourself in front of the listing agents and if possible the sellers at all times. Now in order to do that, in order to do it effectively, you have to know this contract. So now we currently have six hours of videotape. We have four hours of our offer class that goes through this thing line by line by line by line. And we have two hours of this videotape which kind of talks about very similar items. And I would suggest that if you go back and you replay that those six hours of tape and you basically commit, and by the way, you need to be able to commit this contract pretty much to memory, okay? You want to be able, who's got a pen? I don't know if this is going to show up very well on the video, probably not because I think most of you are off camera, but it is amazing what happens if I take a contract and I turn it around and I'm sitting across the table, I'm sitting across the table from my, from my client. Denise, why don't you slip stuff up here a little bit? I don't know if you're going to show up on camera. Hopefully this will be caught on the camera. But I now have a con. No, sit down right there. Oh, okay, go ahead and stand right there. That's, that's fine. Okay. I have this contract. We're sitting at a table. The contract is facing Denise. I'm going through it. All I see is just the bold bullet points. Financing terms. Okay, earnest money deposit, yada, yada, yada. Loan amount. Okay, deposit needs to be increased, da, da, da. You need to have this committed so you literally can have this thing a foot or two away from you, in front of your client, explain it pretty much word for word. It's really nice if you have some key um, words within the contract committed to memory. Because then you can kind of point right to them and kind of look, you know, point, point to the contract, have the, have the wife looking at it while you're talking to the husband reading the contract when you're not even looking at it. I gotta tell you, does that make an impression? And then the cool part is when you get down to the bottom, it's amazing what happens when you sit back and say, just grab my pen and just go ahead and sign right there. Just give me an initial right there. Okay, see how easy that was? I gotta tell you, if you go ahead and have a seat, you did very, very well. It is amazing what happens when you push a contract in front of somebody and you take a pen and you put the pen right where they're supposed to sign your initial. I'm telling you, it's amazing what happens. Try it. People will grab that pen and start writing their name. Now, especially if they're buyers. If they are buyers and they are ready to go and you give that to them and they sign it, 
you have a buyer. Mm -hmm. Now if they pull back, one of two things has happened. Either you've moved too fast, too strong, maybe unprofessional, okay, and that's where you got it. There is a there is a gas and a brake pedal with this. And there's a danger with this. Now, don't take this danger and say, well, Lance, so there's a danger, so I don't have to ask the question. If you ask that question in the wrong way too fast, you will lose your buyer. Because now your buyer is, oh, all he wants to do is sell me something. All he wants is a commission. But the alternative is never asking the question ever, 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 ever. Keep in mind, I've already asked 15 other questions, right? I've already asked if this is the house, does it face the right direction, is the price, the carpet, the repairs, whatever. And then, of course, you ask the question, well, it sounds like you're ready to go. Should we write it up here or shall we go back to the office? Okay. No, I don't have any paperwork. I don't have a pen. I don't have anything in front of me. Shall we write it up here? Are you guys all prepared to draft a contract in the kitchen of a vacant property? If you're not, get prepared to do that. Get your, get your iPad. Get your book. Get your ability to, to do this. Even if you're doing it handwritten, I don't care. Be prepared to do that. Because if the client says, yeah, this is it, Can, let's do it, can we do it right here? The answer to that question is, <coughs> yes, we can do it right here. I'll tell you what, you guys go out in the backyard, let me go out to my car, I'm going to get my computer, I'm going to get my portable printer, I'm going to get all my stuff, the power is on, I'll plug right in here, and we're going to do it right here in the kitchen. Okay? Now, if you've already gotten to that, or if they say, you know, should we write it up here, or do you want to go back to the office? Well, let's go back to the office. It's more comfortable. It's kind of cold here, and it's, it's, it's dark, and we're losing daylight. Okay, great. Let's go back to the office. You already have permission to do this. Mm -hmm. They've already given you permission at the house. You fill out the agreement. You start with the agency disclosure. Hey, you know what? Before we even get into any contracts, well, we can't say that. Before we get into the agreement, there's a disclosure form I need you to sign. It's an agency disclosure form. It just says I'm representing you. Would you mind signing it? They've already given you permission to put the pen in their hand. Okay? So, I'm telling you, you have to be here, you Oscar. We haven't messed up too much of your note yet. So, um, you have to ask those questions. You have to be able to ask those closing questions, which is all part of the offer negotiation and presentation class. Okay. Uh, we are, by the way, we've got to do a whole nother two hour class on listing presentations, negotiation techniques, closing techniques. And a lot of what we just discussed in the last five or ten minutes is going to tie into those classes.